So, so what's the problem? We're just saying that the further research is warranted. We're not saying it's not true. We're just saying further research is warranted and it's got everybody in a tizzy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Houston Ensemble Podcast. We've got a wonderful episode today. We are joined by Dr. James Tor, Professor of Material Sciences and Nanotechnology at my alma mater, Rice University. Uh, I came across Dr. Tor watching one of his videos uh, that came out some uh, semi-recently about graphene oxide and the potentials of what it can do. And Rice is at the forefront of a lot of different technologies, specifically nanotechnology and other stuff. And it's just extremely interesting to see what is going on with that. So Dr. Tor, we are very thankful that you're here today. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, Just right off the bat, can you tell the people who you are, what you do, and we'll go from there. My name is Jim Tour. I'm a professor at Rice University. I'm a synthetic organic chemist. I work in the area of nanotechnology, and uh, and I love Jesus Christ more than anything else in the world. And I love to tell people about that if they're interested. If they're not interested, I'm not interested in, in, uh, in talking to them about it. But if they're interested, uh, uh, I love to tell people about Jesus. So if people have not heard do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm even willing to go one-on-one with that person and tell them about why I believe that. And uh, um, just send me an email to tour at drjamestour.org and we'll get together either by Zoom or in person. So that's who I am. Thank you. Beautiful. Now, what is cool is that there are multiple dimensions to you, which I've learned about recently as I've done more research on you as well as Armin. And um, the religious aspect is very interesting because in your field, I would say that religion and, you know, a love for all, for Jesus uh, is usually not taken well in general, you know, and I know that you're part of something or uh, some group entitled the descent from Darwinism. And I understand that there's a lot of heat surrounding that. Not from me personally. I'm actually extremely sympathetic. Armin and I would be both very sympathetic to everything that you're saying, but I, I was able to kind of see what some other people said. And these people take that very seriously. Do you think that you could maybe talk a little bit about exactly what the descent from Darwinism is since that's such a specific thing? Yeah, I, I don't know that it's a it's a group. We never have gotten together. I don't know anyone else in the group. I don't, it, so what happened was it was around 2000, 2001, somewhere around there. An email was sent to me and it says that, uh, uh, can you agree with this statement? And the statement goes something like this. You can look at it online if you just did Descent from Darwinism, but it's something like this. Uh, we are skeptical of, of uh, random mutation and natural selection being able to account for the diversity of life. Therefore, further investigation is warranted. Therefore, further investigation is warranted. That's it. That's it. And I said, yeah, I can agree to that. And so lo and behold, I ended up on a list of people that I'm not ashamed of, but it's crazy that that, um, a scientist says, yes, further, further research is warranted. And that's like, oh, how can you believe that? I mean, what area doesn't need further research? I mean, in in fact, natural selection and random mutation is no longer the going mantra. That was Darwinianism. That's no longer the going mantra for, for, for evolution anyway. It's, 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 um, it's neutral drift and universal common descent. So, so what's the problem? We're just saying that the further research is warranted. We're not saying it's not true. We're just saying further research is warranted and it's got everybody in a tizzy. 
It is widely known that the tobacco and diet industries lobby governments with scientific propaganda for years until proven guilty in court. The artificial treatment of our water is the next corporate deception. For example, virtually every nation in Europe has rejected the use of artificial fluoride. International studies since the 40s have repeatedly shown that endocrine and neurological effects increase after repeated consumption, even at the levels accepted by U.S. government. Epic Water Filters is the most thorough industry-grade filtration system that Houston Ensemble has ever used. They reduce heavy metals upward of 99.5% such as lead and mercury, bacteria like E. coli, and poisons like chromium, nitrate, and fluoride. Join us in our journey to living a toxin-free life and get your epic water filter using discount code Houston Ensemble lowercase one word. That's Houston Ensemble lowercase one word for 20% off your epic water filter. <laughs> because what I think is because it's a religion. Religion gets you really upset when people start picking on your religion because you don't have answers for it. If it's science, yeah. you just deal with it. That's the problem. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm locked and loaded on this. You, you start put, you, you know, asking me questions about this, I just get very excited. Good. Uh, and, and I guess it's because, because I've had so many people come at me, you, you know, you just, you just uh, uh, get excited. Of course. And, you know, we were able to see some of those people come at you in, in our research. And I do think it, it seems a little ridiculous. And I, I like how you put it all, all that, we're asking for you're asking for everybody should be asking for is more research more knowledge it seems like people who are a hundred percent attached to a, a materialist outlook think that they know literally everything already and i think that's a huge problem you would probably agree to that yourself as a renowned scientist i don't know that they say that they know everything already but as far as as far as evolution, many people say that that is a fact. And and first of all, evolution is a slippery term. Uh, uh, there is there are small changes that occur from one generation to another, and this is this is this is well worked out, and this is well accepted by many people. The thing that that bothers people is is something that has been termed macroevolution. I don't like to to uh, uh, segregate it in that way. But what we're talking about is, is complete body, pan, body plan changes. How do you get these, these gross system changes, one system to another? It's very hard scientifically to envision. Now, people can come up with stories. And they'll say, well, one small change at a time. But that tells me absolutely nothing about the details of this. So, so the word evolution itself is a slippery term. And people will say it's a fact. It's not a fact. It is a theory. It is a theory like many theories. Just like the origin of the universe, it's a theory on how this is, is coming about. In 10 to the minus 42 seconds, there's this amazing change that occurs from nothing. This thing starts to burst forth. Um, uh, this is a theory. Nobody's ever been there. Nobody's ever seen it. Nobody's ever seen system changes. So it's a theory. And so I'm fine with it being a theory. Show me some specifics on this theory and, 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 uh, and convince me. And all I need is my colleagues to say, okay, Jim, let's go to lunch and I'll tell you about it. Because even high school students can understand this. So you'd think that I'd be able to understand it with all the chemistry that I know, but maybe I know too much chemistry. Maybe you can't just, just uh, uh, wiggle through this. You're gonna have to give me some specifics. And you'd think if it's so easy for me to understand, one of my colleagues would nicely engage me and talk with me about it. Nobody's come forward. What does that tell you? It tells you that uh, um, it's probably more of a religion and there's a lot of lot of problems here. That's what it tells me. You know, um, I gotta say, I actually admire, I uh, admire the um, the enthusiasm with which you speak on this subject. Because really, I, I could take in many directions. It really depends. It, it's kind of getting me heated just listening to you talking about it. And I, I want to just go deep into the waters right now, but. How about I start a little slow? You know, when we imagine what could possibly give us enough evidence to maybe at least demonstrably show warrant the claims of Darwinian evolution, and I could imagine maybe a, a machine that could propel or exacerbate evolutionary change in an organism, and maybe you could put that organism in the machine, and then it could rapidly induce evolution, but then... It, I would think, well, how would we do that? We'd have to create a, a system that would induce that evolution, but it would be our own system. How would we know that that was 
the naturally occurring system or God's or the intelligent design system or whatever it is. And then also, are we just simply, like you said, are, is this just this one giant a- assumption that we've labeled a theory that these spontaneous evolutions can occur to begin with? I think maybe the best, one of the best pieces of evidence for evolution probably is, like you said, macro, I would say maybe micro evolution. Like in a, in a few generations of, 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 of a moth's um, progeny, you would see changes in the patterns of its wings depending on the environment, you know, between 50 to 70 years, things of that nature. But then again, how does that explain entire changes in structures? And you mentioned it's that it's a religion. Um, what have you had any experience in the scientific community with indoctrination of younger scientists or events in which you could see that maybe perhaps there was a, also an effort to get the scientific community on a certain ideological plane? You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I don't know much about ideology, but I can tell you, yes, there's indoctrination at all levels, from from primary school to middle school, high school, uh, uh, right on up into the academy. It is so bad that even professors themselves do not know the distinction between origin of life and evolution. Origin of life being chemical phenomena where you go from non-life to life and evolution being how you transform one type of cell into another type of cell, and then one type of organism into another type of organism. And so even faculty members mess that up. So we are told at a young age that there's a primordial soup and these things happen, and you we're told at a young age that you, you get these transformations that occur, and so you come from some common ancestor and there's these mutations that occur now as far as there this this distinguishing between microevolution macroevolution if you want to use those terms we can certainly use those terms i don't particularly like them but they were not terms that were introduced by by any christian community or the descent from Dar- darwinism community that that's th- those are terms that were brought in by biologists themselves we certainly see evolution we see evolution in my own laboratory we're, we work with bacteria and you can see you can see changes where dna has changed or, or one one organism one bacterium is exchanging dna with other other bacteria and and uh and then these things are, are modifying and changing and becoming resistant we can see that type of thing you can see small changes from one generation to another my children have have small changes that have occurred from me to them though that, that that's called neutral drift these things change you know, some people will say, well, there's no speciation changes. There absolutely are. There are plants that for some unknown reason will some will spontaneously double in their DNA. And so you have a, a technically a new species. So that does happen. We do see that. But we do not see gross changes, gross body plan changes. We don't see an auditory system, uh, our, our ability to hear, turn into a visual system. We don't see system changes. We don't see an immune system, which which people love to throw at you and say, well, look how the immune system works. Yes, it, 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 it certainly does, and that's how it works. But that immune system stays an immune system. It does not become a digestive system. These are what I'm talking about, system changes or body plan changes, the arrangement of limbs. Uh, we've never seen anything like that. So, so how we would induce that, we, we don't even see it in, in the small organisms with which we work where you can certainly have a mutation, you can cause a mutation, and that will cause some, some sort of disorder. Most mutations are, are not beneficial, and uh, uh, it's not to say that all mutations are not beneficial. I mean, that, that, that you can certainly see this, but you don't see these gross changes. So all, all we're saying is, is uh, show us more. Let's do more research before we embrace this thing and start teaching this to school children such that when they get into high school, they're not questioning it because they've always been taught this. They get to the university, they don't question it. And these these fictitious pictures are put forth in textbooks, even at the advanced college level. So this is not just a little a thing for little kids. And I'm telling you, even at the professorial level, there is great confusion on these matters. And that's why when I say to my colleagues, come forth, just 
just come forth and explain it to me. Step. There's only one colleague that I have. His name is Joshua Swamidas, who spent three days with me explaining to me how he views evolutionary changes occurring. One, one that's come forward. And I flew to the University of Washington in St. Louis to spend days with him for him to teach me this. Wow. Very few people want to engage on this thing. Very few, because the details aren't there. Mm. The chemical details are not there. You want to fly over 30,000 feet, a lot of things look easy. But then you get down into New York City and you see the complexity and you go under the ground and you see all the sophistication keeping that city running. It's a very different thing. Mm. And so biologists like to talk in these grand schemes. Bring me down to the chemistry where this has to happen. Bring me down from the 30,000 foot level to the to the world in which this happens. And the answers are not so readily there, because if they were, they would have explained it to me. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Why is it so aggressive, the indoctrination? Is it cognitive dissonance? Is it something from a top down where it's like there's technocrats or maybe bureaucrats at the top that kind of say, well, we need this curriculum to be you know, proliferated. We need this to be in the lexicon. We need this to be the trajectory. Is there anything like that? I mean, how does this happen? I'm not a philosopher, so I don't know what the genesis of this is. Um, uh, the, those who put forth curricula generally don't know the details. And so if you know the details, you say, well, we really don't know this. And, and I'm fine with them teaching this as long as they say that this is conjecture. This is speculation. This could be, but we're not sure. I'd be fine with it. But to put it forth as if, it, as if it's well known, and people have this idea that, that somehow scientists know. Scientists must know. And so if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. But scientists don't know. They don't know. Because if they know, they come and they talk to me about this. Give me the details of this thing. And so it's much easier just to criticize Jim Tour and people like him. And, 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 and so most of the people who will take a position like I have are not, you know, frontline researchers, the researchers at, uh, you know, other universities where they're not doing, you, you know, the, the most sophisticated of research, where they're mostly uh, uh, focused on teaching. And so people will ridicule them. Uh, um, and so, so, you know, you can, you can throw all the names at me that you want. But why don't you just just come and sit with me and explain to me if it's so easy? Just come and explain it to me. And and I've dealt with this. People people contact me on the internet and they they say all these things and they say, well, you got to read this paper. I mean, I had a guy come at me that he was going to explain it to me. He says, look, you can look this up yourself. I said, why don't you share it with me? And he sent me like eighty links to papers, eighty, which is, which is just an excuse. So I sat down one Saturday and I went through all the links. And I said, is this a game? I'm not seeing any chemistry here. I want to see chemistry, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. I want to see the chemistry that takes place here. And so this is, they think it's so easy. And I've had other people contact me and they think it's so easy. And then they look up some papers and they see the chemistry is not there. They look it up themselves and then they get very worried. They say, well, just look at these papers. Look at this textbook. That's a common thing. Look at this textbook. And I don't play this game anymore. I say, okay, what pages in the textbook? I will get that textbook from my library. On one occasion, I said, my library doesn't have it. I will buy it. I'm buying the textbook. It was a professor here at the Baylor College of Medicine. And he, he referenced the textbook. I said, you got to tell me the pages. I'm getting the textbook. I'm ordering it. We're going to get together at lunch. You're going to show me the chemistry. And you know what happened? He said, if you've already ordered the book, I'll reimburse you. We're not meeting. Oh, what does that tell you? <laughs> what does that tell you? That's what I'm talking about. And it's and often it's the lay person who doesn't understand the details of chemistry. They will think that they can explain it to me. But as soon as I start asking for the details of chemistry, it's not there. And, and I, I've had very famous people tell me it's well worked out. I said, okay, show me the articles where it's well worked out. And they show me, they've sent, send me a few articles on a bunch of fish heads. He says, show me the chemistry. I want to see the chemistry there on how this can happen. And then I never get a response. That's what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. So obviously further research is warranted. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can get on another topic and I'll be a lot more calm. Totally. <laughs> hey, I think we Good totally... To 
totally agree with you. And we appreciate everything that you had to say about that. I think that you're exactly right that when, you know, just when it goes for all topics, when lay people try to get at it and it's easy, it's easy to float by and not go into the details. Let's talk about what you are doing specifically at Rice University, your research. Um, you know, as I mentioned, one of the videos, I'd watched multiple videos, but one of the videos that was really interesting was in the lab when you were using the laser to do the graphene oxide uh, sensors, I believe. And I'm, I'm sure I will get something wrong as, you know, I'm not in this field. But can you speak to what you're doing at Rice University right now? Well, we are doing everything. It is just amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we're just blowing it open. So we, we've got this area called flash graphene where we can take any carbon material and convert it into graphene. What is graphene? It's single atomic sheets of graphite. And it looks like chicken wire. And it's one of the strongest materials known at that level um, because the carbon-carbon bond is one of the strongest bonds in the universe. And it's a bond order of about 1.3. So you don't just have a carbon-carbon single bond. You have uh, uh, oscillating bonds in addition to that. So it's about a bond order of 1.3. So it's super strong sheets. And the nice thing about this is when you convert things into graphene, they don't readily enter the CO2 cycle again. So they're not going to end up in the atmosphere because the vast majority of resources that we bring up from under the ground eventually will end up as carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Mm. But we've learned how to take any carbon material like coal, coke, uh, a metallurgical coke, and turn it into graphene, food waste, mm. uh, waste plastic. I mean, this is a huge deal. You can take all this junk. The vast majority of waste that humans generate are carbon because we're, we're carbon entities. If, we, if we'd been built out of silicon, I'm sure we'd eat, we'd eat sand, we'd eat silicon sources. But we eat carbon sources because we're made out of carbon. So the vast majority of our food is carbon-based. And so, so um, uh, we, can, we, we can turn all of this human trash. If you look in your trash that you throw out, you leave it at the, at, at the side of the road. If it's not metal, if it's not ceramic, it's carbon waste. And, mm. and uh, um, just think of how much waste you, you throw out that's carbon. We can turn that waste into graphene. So when you, when you throw out food waste, when you throw out trash, it's going to eventually enter into the CO2 cycle again. It's, 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 it's just a, it's like a nightmare. And, and uh, we can do this. So this is huge. So we started this company, uh, one of about a 10 companies or more that I've started, uh, 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 manufacturing companies. I have a few other uh, on the financial side, but but uh, uh, that, that make products, and uh, uh, but this one is just taken off like a rocket. It's called Universal Matter, and so we've got a website, universalmatter.com, and you can see little movies there of what we can do. Another technology, which I think you were referencing, was laser-induced graphene, where we can take any surface and we can convert it into writing patterns of graphene, and that we discovered in 2013, and and uh, now. So we published the first paper in 2014, discovered it in 2013, and patented it. Uh, first paper 2014. We've published about 30 papers on it. But what's more telling is there's, there's about five papers per week in the literature coming out on laser-induced graphene. Everybody's using this process to build devices of all kinds, and and uh, um, and so so it is the way to make graphene if you're going to be making devices. The other one is bulk graphene that you can put that graphene in concrete, in asphalt, triple the life of an asphalt road. You 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 can use one third less concrete. I mean it's great, but it's bulk graphene. Then you have the laser patterning graphene, mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, uh, so that's in a company called LIGC Applications. It's LIGC and uh, laser stands for laser induced graphene. And uh, uh, LIG is laser-induced graphene, so the company's LIGC. And, and um, uh, uh, so that's doing a lot of things. And then we're taking this, this method that we used for making bulk graphene, this flash dual heating, and we have expanded it. We're converted, uh, changing it so that we can, we can recycle lithium-ion batteries. All these lithium-ion batteries you have in your cell phones, you have in your cars. I mean, the cars are the big killer. I mean, these things are going to be coming due in a few years because usually they run eight to ten years. What do you do with all of them? Only 5% of lithium-ion batteries are recycled, uh, and that's because you lose money in the process, and it's an environmental nightmare. Uh, because you have to use large amounts of acidic water, large amounts of oxidizing agent, 
or you have to use these huge furnaces that heat everything to 2200 degrees over a long time period. And so we found a way, we just, boom, we just flash this and we totally uh, uh, um, uh, recycle the cathode that way. We don't have to rebuild the cathode because we only put it in this flash system for about uh, uh, something on the order of less than a second. And so you can recycle lithium ion batteries. We can recycle uh, uh, what's called, it's called urban waste, all the printed circuit boards, all the computers you throw out that all get shipped off overseas to third world countries to try to recycle some of this stuff. And it's an environmental nightmare, the, the, the ways you have to do this. And we just cut it up, flash it, boom, we get out the precious metals, we can get out the heavy metals, we can get out, out the rare earth elements. We just learned how to flash fly ash. Fly ash is the residue after coal burning, you're left with inorganics. And it turns out, there's mountains of this stuff, and it's just an absolute waste. We don't know what to do with it. No country does. We just flash this. We get out rare earth elements, rare earth elements, which are needed for all our computers, which are really hard to get otherwise. I mean, just so much happening. And, and then we have companies that, that make drugs for, for pharmaceutical industry. We have something going into phase two for pancreatic cancer. We have a, a, a spinal cord rebuilding with graphene nano ribbons. We have a, a, we're starting a new company for a drug for traumatic brain injury, stroke, and dementia. I mean, there's the mother load, dementia. I mean, and and, mm -hmm. uh, and and Congress will help you out with that because everybody in Congress is like 200 years old and they all need it. And so so, so the, the, you, 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 there, there's, there's a, a lot of emphasis on this. We can soil remediation. Uh, we, have, we have companies that, that uh, make carbon dots and they've built COVID sensors, COVID detectors for, for 200. You can ch test 200 people in like 10 minutes. It's amazing that, that how you can do this. You do a whole airplane of people and see if they have COVID. It's more reliable than, than the PCR test because PCR gives about 1% false positives. We have another company that builds computer memory. We bit builds and, uh, and, and dots and computer memory are both, both uh, um, uh, uh, public companies. So there's a lot going on and I haven't even finished, but I better let you ask another question. Kev, I appreciate all that. Kevin J. McHugh at uh, McHugh Laboratories is also a scientist at Rice University. Are you familiar with him? No. Well, that just goes to show you how, how deep uh, the research goes there. Um, Kevin McHugh is working on something called a quantum dot tattoo. Are you familiar with that at all? I know what quantum dots are. I know what tattoos are. <laughs> I don't know from what you said exactly what he's working on. Well, maybe this will be a dead end and that's totally fine, but this is basically a extremely small uh, chip tattoo thing that gets I placed. It. I got it. You got it. That's right. placed on the skin, holds record, bodily records, blah, 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 blah. What yes. I'm getting at is uh, graphene oxide has sensorial possibilities, right? It can be, yes. it can be a sensor for something. Yes. Do these things have a relationship in the sense that there would be something similar for graphene, uh, on the human body being some right. sort of biometric so, so, sensor? So graphene oxide is made from graphene the process to make graphene oxide. The, the process that's used more in the world than any other process is called the modified Hummers procedure. And it was developed mm -hmm. in my group in 2010. So, so that, that paper that we published in 2010 has about 10,000 citations, which is kind of a lot for a single paper. And uh, uh, so we know how to make graphene oxide. The problem with, so graphene oxide is very good. I mean, it, it doesn't conduct nearly as well as graphene, uh, uh, but, but things bind to it, okay? But the problem with graphene oxide that most people don't appreciate is it degrades pretty rapidly on contact with water. It keeps breaking up and it eventually forms humic acid and the, the solution gets quite acidic and it, and it starts degrading within minutes in water. So if you have short term, usually these tattoo type sensors, there's different ways to apply them. Uh, uh, people don't like to generally call them tattoos because they think you're injecting them with, with, with things, but you can apply things on a, on a sort of, a, of tape like system. And that, 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 tape can be made out of a sugar type sus substance and go away. So it's actually on the surface of the skin. That was and this it can, one. Right. And it can get a lot, a lot of information that you can get. I mean, some of my former students have built those from off of laser induced graphene. And, uh, and again, the problem with, but, but the decomposition rate of graphene oxide, if you're not in water is slow enough 
that you can use these sensors for a day or two days, maybe three days, but you're going to be losing your signal after that, and that's due to the decomposition of the graphene oxide. But a lot of times a sensor for hours is, is good enough, depending on what you want to do. You know, When you work out, you want to know your heart rate, you want to know different things that are happening, and your workout may be one or two or three hours, and then you're done, and then you're going to be fine for that. But for longer-term sensors, graphene oxide is going to have trouble just because of uh, its instability in water. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you can encase this because this has to generally uh, uh, interface with your electrolytes. It has to in interface with, with uh, the perspiration. It has to be getting its signal somehow. And the other thing that I will mention is that, is that people don't, don't mention enough the, the need for a power source. So graphene oxide by itself doesn't do anything. You have to have a power source. So you generally have to have a battery or supercapacitor, something else built in there. Uh, you don't have to have a battery. You could have a little RFID tag antenna and then just uh, uh, blast this with a microwave, uh, with a radio wave, and that radio wave then charges up the system and it sends a signal back. That's what like the easy tag is on your car. You drive right through. There's no battery in that little, in that little uh, uh, sticker. What it is is an RFID tag made out of silicon, and, and uh, uh, the radio wave comes and hits that, charges it, and that then sends the signal back with another radio wave back to the sensors as you you know you, you can be going through 90 miles an hour and it's going to get it so that's that's all rfid tag based sensing and so you can do that you don't have to have the power source built into it as long as you're hitting it but you have to be fairly close you have to be within i don't know a few yards of this thing in order to be able to do this uh, uh um you know it can't be a power source from far away so so yeah i know a lot about these sorts of sensors do you see? Uh, do you foresee a future in which humans are wearing something sort of like this RFID tag that is then in communication with some sort of waves? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're essentially doing it. You're carrying a cell phone. I mean, you're, you're you're essentially a guinea pig. I mean, there's all sorts of sensors that are detecting things about you through your cell phone uh, uh, more than we'd like to know. Mm -hmm. And then you wear, you know, it gets a little closer when you wear an Apple Watch or something, and 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 this information is is recording your your uh, um, your heart rate and your EKG, and all of this is is coming, and it's already on your wrist. And then there's other sensors that you can wear that are that uh, one of my colleagues just built one that you put in your shirt with carbon nanotube wires that 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 uh, uh, gives EKG and other sensory materials and so yeah all, all of this and you, if, if you're going to put it in a smart watch or in a shirt you got enough room for a battery i mean that's okay mm -hmm. and uh and and we wear batteries all the time people have pacemakers they have a battery inside of them and that is that is a lithium battery not a lithium ion battery but a lithium metal battery and those those will last years and years and that's what's in your your smoke detectors at home, you know, they have the new 10 year smoke detector. So you don't have to put in a, a battery every year. That's a, that's a little piece of lithium metal in a, in a, in a little button cell, a coin cell. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, they, they, but there's, there's not that much current drawn from them. That that's why, that's why they go. Okay. Yeah. Where was I correct? Um, I think I heard you say something about graphene oxide for cancer treatment. Yeah, so so I didn't say that in in, in on this broadcast, but um, so we are not using directly graphene oxide. We are using the, something we call uh, oxidized activated charcoal, which is not that much different than graphene oxide. And there's been a lot of spoof on the internet about graphene oxide being in the vaccines, and people are all worried about that. There's no graphene oxide in the vaccines. People will show you pictures of it. They, they snatch that picture somewhere off the internet. This is not in the vaccines. And how do I know? Because the vaccines are clear solutions. If there were any significant concentration of graphene or graphene oxide in there, they would be black. And uh, if they're so dilute that they're clear, then the amount of con the concentration in there is so low. Plus, there's no GMP, good manufacturing practice source of graphene or graphene oxide available that I know of that's, that's FDA approved or near FDA approved or provisionally that FDA approved that would allow graphene oxide to be in any of these solutions in the vaccine. So if you want to take a vaccine, fine. If you don't want to take the vaccine, I'm not suggesting you should take it. Don't take it. It's up to you. 
I'm not commenting on the efficacy of mRNA. I'm just telling you that if there were graphene or graphene oxide in there, you're worried about, why would you be worried about graphene oxide anyway? Some people say it causes blood clots. I don't know that we use it all the time. We've injected this in, in mice for different applications at much higher concentrations, such solutions are black. We've never seen any blood clots. So I don't know why you'd want to put it in the vaccine, but in any case, we use these very small particles that are about three nanometers that oxidized carbon. And it is those oxidized carbons that react with superoxide. Superoxide is generated in the face of trauma. So if there's been a traumatic brain injury, if there's been stroke, where you have uh, ischemic reperfusion in injury, that's a stroke, you have a clot. And so the brain is going without oxygen because blood can't get in there. Then when you go to the hospital, they open up that clot either manually with a, with, a, with a tool, or they give you a drug that opens up the clot and then fresh oxygenated blood can go in. When that happens, that burst of oxygen causes something to overexpress and that's the generation of something called superoxide. That is the reduction process the reduction compound of oxygen, the molecule O2, you add an electron to it, you get the radical I, NI, and that's superoxide. That superoxide is generated biologically in very small amounts to fight invading organisms and things, but it's now generated in excess and it causes degradation to the brain. Same thing happens with traumatic brain injury when there's ischemic reperfusion injury, uh, uh, where, where the brain is, is blood starved and then it gets a spike of blood. There are related things that happen with dementia. So now what can happen is these oxidized nanoparticles come in and they will oxidize superoxide, bringing it back to oxygen. That is a great thing. And so that's what they do. And that's what we're using them for. And then the oxidized nanoparticles do other things for dementia where they take care of uh, uh, the high, the hydroxyl radical formation that occurs through something called the Fenton reaction. But it is amazing chemistry. And, uh, and yes, you're using oxidized nanoparticles to do this sort of thing in treatment. And we've used, we've used graphene oxide um, uh, that then we've reduced to graphene to, to rebuild spinal cords. I mean, it's, it's just amazing the chemistry that can be done. It is so much fun to do this kind of work to help humanity. Yeah. It, it seems really interesting, all the possibilities that it has. It kind of seems limitless. In your uh, connection with the Department of Defense, what are things when they come to you and are looking for research, what, what are they looking for? What are some of the things that you've worked on specifically? We've done a bunch of things with the Department of Defense. I've had funding from them What's for the scariest? well over 30 years. <laughs> the scariest. Well... I don't work on explosives. I don't work on chemical weapons. I mean, one of the things that I did is I, I devised a route to inhibit uh, chemical terrorism, to stop people from being able to easily build weapons of chemical terror. And, and uh, when I told the government how easy it was, many people in the government contacted me, like from Detroit. They said, no, you're wrong. You can't build it that easy. You can't make it that easy. So just to demonstrate it, um, I called some students into my office. This was, this was a long time ago. This was like in about 2003, somewhere around there. And I called these couple guys in my office and they were graduate students doing chemistry in my lab. I said, I want you to forge my name on anything you like. And I want you to build, I want you to make, uh, uh these specific nerve agents. And that was it. Wow. It was up to them to figure out how to do it. 18 hours later, they called me into the lab and they showed me the setup. They had ordered, they had forged my name, they ordered the chemicals, I had it shipped here by Federal Express. They set the thing up and I think it was, I don't know, 180 or $280. I, I, I have slides on all of this, but, and they, they set up to make sarin, somon, and GF, three really nasty nerve agents. This is not just a, these are nerve agents, really nasty. And they set this whole thing up and and uh, um, and so we demonstrated it, and then we went and we presented it to people in government, a number of government agencies, and and uh, uh, they hired these two guys actually upon their graduation. Uh, so so it can certainly be done. And so then we set up a system to make it harder for that to happen. So it it, it would it would uh, uh, give out clues when people were trying to do this. So that was probably the scariest. Uh, other things we've done, we worked on stealth technology. And so when we got up 
uh, working too closely with this, we would send samples off for testing to places that don't exist. So I would send them to a place that doesn't exist and they would get tested at that place that doesn't exist. And then they shut down everything. <clears throat> they, they shut down the research on it and they, they, um, they closed up the patent. So it became a national security patent and couldn't publish on it. And, uh, um, so, so, um, you know, that was before stealth technology got out. Now, wow. now a lot of it's gotten out. So things like that, but now we just got, we just, just a couple of days ago, just two days ago, we got a big $5.2 million grant from the Army Corps of Engineers. And that's to work on graphene and other flash dual heating type systems for remediation, for dealing with waste. Uh, um, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very big deal. And for, for strengthening concrete, we're using less concrete because they have to set up airstrips and they have to, they have to set up uh, um, uh, asphalt strips and, and so how do you toughen it and and how can you make material how can you take the material that's there the waste that, that would be there on site and just treat it so that now you can put it into concrete use less concrete and and uh, how can you recycle batteries right there i mean so so we just got a, a lot of money for that but we've we've had a lot of money from the air force and from the army and the navy over the years um mm. which has probably been my biggest source of support has been has been the Department of Defense. And e even they have supported the traumatic brain injury work. Uh, they supported a lot of that over the years. So uh, they're, they're really into to healthcare as well. That is very interesting. I was wanting to mention two things because you're so knowledgeable about this. So I just wanted to just see how much you can, how much information you just give out. There's something very interesting that was released on September 27th of 2020. And I'm going to go ahead and spell this out so anybody can look it up for themselves. It's patent number CN11222019A. one one two 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 zero nine one nine a recombinant vaccine taking graphene oxide as carrier. It was registered in the Chinese government patent database by Shanghai National Engineering Research Center for Nanotechnology. And when I first saw this, you know, obviously, like you said, there's been a lot of mention circling around about graphene oxide being in vaccines. Now, I'm the kind of person that wouldn't even humor something like that unless I had an electron microscope or something similar and I could look at it for myself. But it was interesting that this was a patent and which would got me thinking, how could graphene oxide be used as a carrier for the payload in the vaccine or whatever it is that we were trying to you know, sure. Yeah. Sure. We, we, we've used we've used uh, oxidized carbon, <clears throat> graphene oxide type compounds for many years as care. We have lots of, of papers on this. <clears throat> and so what happens is, is the, these compounds are quite anionic. And if you have a cationic package, you can stick it to this and uh, uh, you can use it as a delivery vehicle, but none of this is commercial. You say it came out of Beijing, China. Yeah, Beijing, China, lots of things come out. You do lots of academic research, but as far as an FDA approved drug, no way, no way. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and that, that formulation, do they show any pictures of that formulation and the color of the formulation? It's certainly not gonna be clear unless there's such so little amount that it's not it's going to be insignificant anyway but yes it can be a carrier we have used this as a carrier for a number of different chemotherapy agents for cancer and uh, uh and it and it can work well but from what i know from the literature what is used is a, a there's a liposomal system and a liposome is much like a li much like a, a cellular bilayer and uh you could build a liposomal system and you could pack the the, the mrna into that or you can use you can use a, um, a soap like particle it isn't a lipid bilayer, but it just has a polar end and a nonpolar tail. And you can package the RNA in that there's papers on that. Mm -hmm. But remember, if that came out in 2020, the mRNA vaccines came out of uh, uh, Pfizer and out of Moderna. And those th th those finally came out in 2021 were being issued. So 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 
I don't know that 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 Chinese patent. I'd have to read it, but it, it didn't sound like they were packaging it with mRNA. Number one, number two, the Chinese vaccine doesn't work very well at all. They sold that vaccine to their their and and I'm not talking about the 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 graphene oxide package one. I'm just talking about the general Chinese vaccine didn't work very well. They sold that, I think, to Brazil and everybody got COVID anyway. It didn't work. And they sold it to Pakistan and it didn't work very well. And if this little graphene oxide package were working, uh, they would have been using that. Uh, 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 so they don't have a very good vaccine in China. So, and it's like I said on the videos on, 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 on my YouTube channel, DR James Tour, when I talked about this, is that, yes, there's lots of academic things, things out of universities that have been done with graphene oxide, but none of that has gotten into the body because there's no GMP source. By GMP source, it stands for good manufacturing practice. Anything that goes into a formulation of food or or a, a drug that's going to be used in people has to be GMP approved, meaning that it has to have this whole uh, a chain you have to go through to say that that uh, each component that has gone into that has to be approved. I know a lot about graphene oxide. I know of no GMP's approved source of graphene oxide because how do you make graphene oxide? You have to get it from graphene. And how do you get that graphene? You can get it from exfoliation of graphite generally. And you have to do certain chemistries on that. None of that has been approved to my knowledge. So yeah, you can find patents and publications. You can find even wilder publications than that. But it doesn't mean anything. None of that has gotten near people. In academia, we do the strangest, wildest things that are nowhere near being allay, allowed to be put in people, and they shouldn't be. And to so go, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and to go with that, I, I, you're absolutely correct. And I think a lot of people, especially in the current time period right now, of, uh, you know, relating to COVID-19, would be worried about those, um, those events because Namely, because if what we're learning about slash what we have learned about regarding Wuhan and the lab and the gain of function and all that stuff that has been under fire for, you know, testing and learning about viruses. What do you think when it comes to that area, when it comes to, you know, that laboratory, the research that they're doing as a scientist, what do you see? What do you think? I don't know anything about that laboratory. I've never been there. But I can tell you that, that laboratories that work on these sorts of systems, I've been in them in, 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 in other parts of the world as well. You have to be exceedingly careful because things can easily get out and escape. And, and so, so I don't know anything about that lab. All I know is what has been in the popular press regarding that lab, but I'm just telling you any lab that works on these sort of toxic compounds, these viral compounds, you got to be so careful because if it gets out and you say, well, how does it get out? Well, the person doesn't know that they're taking it out. They've worked on it. Their, their, their equipment wasn't working right and they were exposed to it. Now they're carrying this virus out with them. Right. And then they go out, they have a family, they meet people and they start spreading it around and it just propagates exponentially. And when I say exponential, I really mean exponential. Lots of people use that term to mean the rapid growth. No, with viruses, it's truly exponential growth. And the exponent is a big exponent. It's not a, it's not a fractional exponent. And so so uh, um, uh, that that's the dangers of it. Mm -hmm. And so so uh, but I, I don't I only know what's in the prop popular press. I don't have any more knowledge about that than anybody else. I think, uh, and I think a lot of the worry are coming, especially from the Freedom of Information Act emails that have come out in the past couple months regarding that. And then basically... Uh, good, 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 good luck. Good luck with China and Freedom of Information Act. Is that coming well, out well, of China? Definitely with China, but definitely with Anthony Fauci here and basically having him on trial. And it's one thing to study them. I totally get that. Obviously, we have to make huge headway in studying things. But when you try and cover up and then are exposed in a lie, that's what worries me. And I think, you know, scientists like yourself who are extremely honorable would be more willing to say, you know, this is dangerous research. We did mess up and this happened, blah, 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 blah. Now here's the goal to fix it. 
when, you know, when you're looking at, and I'd love to get your opinion on this current, um, current government system here in America, what is your perspective on that regarding everything that's happened recently? I don't know any more than anybody else. And so whatever I would say would be speculation. Again, I've never been to Wuhan. I've never seen that lab. I just know that you have to be careful with those types of things. And every lab, every lab has had safety events. Every lab, Mm -hmm. my lab has had safety events. Every lab does. It's just that, you know, in my lab, we don't work on viruses, so so they don't escape. When you're working on, on things like viruses, there's there's extra precautions for those labs. You know, there's, there's yeah. air locking systems and, and things that, that have to be taken. Again, I don't know w- what's happened. I don't know if Wuhan's the source. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm just telling you any lab can have a mistake. As far as Dr. Fauci, I know nothing about him other than what he's seen on seen on, on, on a few shows. I know nothing about it. I don't know anything about this. I mean, so I don't know what kind of person he is. I, I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to give him the benefit of the doubt. I know a lot of people don't want to do that. I just don't know the man. And, and so um, and I don't know anything about Wuhan. And it's just it's hard to get information. You see how hard it is to get information out of our own government, let alone other governments that don't have Freedom of Information Acts. Even when you have a Freedom of Information Act, a lot of the 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 information that you get is redacted. Mm. So you can have this act, but it it, it doesn't really come to you. Uh, And so um, it's 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 hard to know. Now, do scientists make mistakes? Absolutely. Do we like making mistakes? No. Do we like exposing the mistakes we've made? No. Everybody wants to allay the fears of this thing, and, and, and the scientists are just like everybody else. I know nothing about the scientists in this matter. I can just speak about scientists in general. They're just like everybody else. It's, it's just uh, um, you know nobody wants to look bad. Nobody yeah. wants to look bad, but, but also nobody wants to hurt other people. I don't know any scientists that want to hurt other people. And and I even know scientists that work in military operations. Nobody wants to hurt other people. We are trying to understand things so that we can build defensive mechanisms toward it. That's why why, why you do it. And uh, uh, we don't, you, you know, I, I, many governments will say they don't have an offensive program. We only work with these in order to understand how we can build a defense to it. So, so um, uh, most scientists that I know are not trying to hurt anybody. But are there scientists that work in building bombs and explosives? Of course there are. I don't work in those areas, and yeah. uh, uh, I'm not against them. I'm just saying, you know, everybody has to have a military, and I'm not against militaries, and I'm not against countries defending themselves and having weapons. And so, 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 but um, I don't know scientists that, that wake up in the morning and say, let, let me see how many people I can infect today. Yeah, I I would agree with you on that. I think the majority of all people do not want to hurt people. I think sometimes people can be tricked into hurting other people, aka, you know, it's somebody, you know, taking somebody very smart and tricking them into doing something, but that's really neither here nor there. Going back to what we were talking about in the very beginning is, you know, people being religious about their viewpoints, evolution, religion itself. Are you seeing that today when it comes to politics and COVID? Religious about their viewpoints. You, 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 you As mean in willing it, to not, not willing to change their viewpoint. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I see, I see people worried and I understand they're worried. People are not trusting the, the U S government. On, on these issues with vaccine. And I can understand that. I mean, when you have people telling you that that don't wear a mask, it, it's not going to do anything. And I could never understand that. All of our physicians are wearing masks. How can that do nothing? It's going to, and, and, and uh, um, uh, so, so, and then they say, no, oh no, now you should wear a mask. Actually, you should wear a double mask. You should wear two of them. And, and uh, um, when you have certain, politicians saying, I wouldn't take that vaccine. It was, I wouldn't take anything developed by Donald Trump. And then as soon as the election's over, they readily take the vaccine. You're like, huh? I mean, so, (laughs) so so certainly that's going to build distrust. So I understand where the distrust is coming from. I really do. 
That's why I'm not suggesting that anybody get the vaccine. I personally have gotten it. Every one of my family members has gotten it. And, and, uh, uh, but that was a personal decision. And what I am, I am a, a, a real proponent of being, letting people make their own choices. I mean, if you, if you don't want to get the vaccine and you get COVID, I mean, that's on you. And that was the decision you made and, and, you, and you're going to accept it. And that was the decision I made. My son, my own son is a frontline physician because some people don't trust the numbers from the CDC. And I can understand why there's distrust. There's distrust. And so I can understand. So I asked my own son, I said, tell me uh, uh, um, how many, uh, you, you know, especially with this, this Delta spike, I, I said, what percentage of people are coming into the hospital that are unvaccinated versus vaccinated? He says, Dad, I don't have the numbers, but I'm telling you at least 90% of the people that are coming in are unvaccinated. And I said, of those people that are in the hospital, what percentage are the ones that are dying vaccinated versus unvaccinated? He says, Dad, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'll ballpark it. 90% of the people dying are the unvaccinated. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's my own son. And he has no reason to lie to me. And, and uh, you know, he's having to deal with people all the time and he's seeing a lot of death and he's intubating people that, that, that are, you, you know, are, are trying to survive. And so, so uh, um, the vaccines are certainly helpful in that regard. Now, many people say that, look, if they would allow us to take ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine uh, and a Z pack, we'll be just fine. Could be. Could be. It's just a shame that, that they didn't let those those be tested more. And I was like, why, why not test them more? If people are claiming that these are really that good, let them be tested all the more. So yeah. I was all for that, but it, it didn't get tested. But again, I'm just a little voice, I'm just a little man with a little voice. And uh, I don't have any, you know, grand uh, ability to, to get these things to change. So but and I, I, I'm concerned about this like everybody else. But I understand the distrust. And I don't want anybody to get the vaccine that doesn't want it. Nobody should be forced to do this. I think it's sad that they're forced to do this for their jobs. But that's just a personal thing. So other people think, well, it's the unvaccinated that are bothered. How could the unvaccinated be a threat to me if the vaccine is so good? The vaccine is supposed to protect me from the unvaccinated that get COVID. So I, I've never quite understood that either. Yeah, uh, I think you're exactly right. And there are just, you know, a lot of reasons that have created distrust. But I think that you know, this is probably a good ending point and I want to respect your time. We are so grateful that you came on today and we we're able to chat with you. Uh, it means a lot to us. We had a lot. I had so many more questions, <laughs> but Hey, uh, once again, real respectful of your time, respectful of everything you've said thus far. And maybe in the future we could do a follow up. You know, you're just a bank of wealth of information. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to have my wife watch this, at least that, that last five seconds that you just said, so she'd appreciate me all the more. Nah, hey. you got to show her. Be like, see? <laughs> <laughs> Take her out to dinner in our honor. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, okay, everybody, this was Dr. James Tor from Rice University. We uh, will be posting this episode, and I think uh, Dr. Tor will also have a lot of the episode on his channel check it out he's got a lot of great videos on his youtube channel we'll be linking that in the description thank you dr tor 